Hi guys! In this video we're going to be looking at introduction to stationary waves, stationary waves oscillations, nodes and antinodes, and we're going to finish with a summary. We briefly mentioned stationary waves at the beginning of our waves topic, however now we're going to look at them in a lot more detail and try to understand what they are and also how they're formed. Imagine two people are holding a rope taut, one person holding either end. So here we've got two people holding this rope. They both induce waves to travel along the rope using the same motion. The waves travel in opposite directions. So we can see that for both people the direction of oscillation is up and down. So the motion is perpendicular to the line of undisturbed rope. So the blue line here shows the line of undisturbed rope and the direction of propagation. So we can see that our directions of propagation are in opposite directions, so the two waves are moving in opposite directions. So this shows the waves at a time t1, and this shows that the waves that these two people are creating at a time t2. So we can see that here we had a peak, now we have a trough, and then here we have a trough, but now it's become a peak. So the two people here are causing the rope to oscillate up and down. The resulting wave cannot travel in both directions at once. The result is a wave which oscillates in a fixed position. So if we look at our diagram here, which is showing the wave oscillating, we can see that it's not actually moving along, it's just staying fixed. So for example, here we can see we have a peak and then we have a trough. So the wave is oscillating up and down, so the peak becomes a trough in the same spot. And then we have a peak again and then another trough. And this occurs at the same point. So at the same point we have our peaks and then also our troughs. And this happens over fixed time intervals delta t and they're the same. So the time interval between each of these snapshots of our wave is the same and it's fixed. The result is known as a stationary wave or a standing wave. The peaks and troughs do not propagate along like in a progressive wave. A stationary wave forms when two progressive waves of equal frequency travel in opposite directions and are superposed. So for example here we have two progressive waves travelling in opposite directions. So this orange wave is a progressive wave and this pink wave is also a progressive wave. And they are travelling in opposite directions and have equal frequencies. And we can see that the waves are in the same space so they are going to superpose at all times. And then this bottom diagram shows the two waves having moved a displacement in a certain time interval. So we have a time axis going down this way. And in this time interval, they've now been able to align in phase. So the two waves are in phase. And when they align in phase, we get a maximum displacement. So we get maximum constructive interference. And it's the interference between these two waves that creates our stationary wave. And the reason stationary waves are called stationary waves is because unlike progressive waves, a stationary wave oscillates in a fixed position, whereas a progressive wave moves as it oscillates. However, in a stationary wave, the oscillations are stationary. So now we're going to look at stationary wave oscillations in a bit more detail. To form a stationary wave, two progressive waves must travel in opposite directions with the same frequency. So for example here we have the emitter of the pink wave, and here we have the emitter of the orange wave, and this wave has a frequency f2. And in order to get a stationary wave, f1 must be equal to f2. So the two waves must have the same frequency. So we're going to call this common frequency that they both have f because it's the same value. At certain points in time, the waves align to be in phase. So if we have a time axis this way, we can see that at certain times they align. So for example, at a certain time here, 
the peaks haven't aligned. But we can see that the waves are still moving towards each other. And then once they've moved a certain distance here, delta S, they have now aligned. So we can see that all the peaks and troughs are aligned, so we say that now the waves are in phase. The resultant displacement is the vector sum of both progressive wave displacements. So the green line is our equilibrium position, and we can see that when they're aligned, each wave has its own displacement. So that's what the pink and orange arrows show. And then in order to get the resultant displacement, we've seen that we need to add together the wave's displacements vectorially. So we need to do the vector sum, which is what we've got here. So since they're both in the same direction, because the waves are in phase, we add their displacements together. So we then get a resultant displacement in that same direction. So our blue arrow shows the resultant displacement that we've got. At certain points in time, the oppositely directed progressive waves will be in antiphase. So again, we can see at this point here, the waves are neither in phase or antiphase, but they're coming towards each other. So we've got our two peaks. And after a certain time interval, delta t, the waves are in antiphase. So the pink wave has moved a distance delta s in this direction, and the orange wave has moved a distance delta s in the opposite direction. So now the waves are in antiphase. So in this case, we can see that the peaks of one wave are aligned with the troughs of the other and vice versa. So our original peaks that were here have now moved to here. And then we can see that our troughs have moved to here and here. So the peaks are aligned with the troughs. The vector sum of all the displacements is zero if the two progressive waves have equal amplitude. So we're saying now that the waves have the same amplitude, which we're going to call A. And now, if we do the vector sum of these two amplitudes here, we have to take into account that the amplitudes are in opposite directions. So we need to do A minus A, because we need to do the vector sum, so we take the direction into account. So this then gives us a vector sum equal to zero. So because the amplitudes cancel out, our resultant stationary wave looks like this. It's just a straight line. So we have zero displacement throughout the whole stationary wave. In a stationary wave, the direction of displacement of a given point oscillates in time. So the way oscillations occur in a stationary wave is that we consider how the displacement of a certain point changes over time and how it oscillates. So for example, let's consider this point here. And at this point in time, our two waves are in phase. That is, our two progressive waves that make up our stationary wave. They're both in phase. So that means at this point here, where they're in phase, and they both have their amplitude in phase, we're going to get the maximum positive displacement. And then we can consider how the displacement of this point oscillates with time. So after a quarter of an oscillation of our stationary wave, we find that now our two progressive waves are in antiphase. So now that they're in antiphase, we can consider how the displacement of this point has changed. So we're just going to draw a line here to consider how it changes. So a quarter of an oscillation later, we can see that this point is now at zero displacement. So a quarter of an oscillation later, we've gone from a maximum positive displacement to zero displacement. And we can then consider what happens after another quarter of an oscillation. So we can see that our two progressive waves are in phase again. So this means we're going to get maximum constructive interference. So that's why we can see that at our point here, we've now got maximum negative displacement. And this is because the amplitudes of the two progressive waves are aligned in the negative direction at this point, so we get a maximum negative displacement. So we can see, therefore, that over time, this point oscillates between a maximum positive displacement, zero displacement, maximum negative displacement, then back to the zero displacement, and then back 
to the maximum positive displacement. That is one complete oscillation. So we've seen that with our stationary wave, we have certain points where we have maximum displacement and certain points where we have zero displacement. So we actually call these points nodes and antinodes. So now we're going to look at these points of zero displacement and resultant displacement in more detail. The points of zero resultant displacement on a stationary wave are fixed in position. So the grey line is our equilibrium. And if we look at the points of zero displacement at every point in time on this stationary wave, we can see that they always occur at the same point on the wave. Because remember, a stationary wave doesn't actually move. It's the direction of the displacement of a point that oscillates. So we can see that these points of zero displacement don't move. So the points of resultant displacement don't move over time. So we've got fixed time intervals here, delta t, and we can see that over these time intervals, the points of zero resultant displacement stay at zero. So for example, from here, we've now had half an oscillation of our stationary wave. So over these time intervals of delta t, we've had half an oscillation. And that's because we can see that if we look at this point here, we begin at a maximum displacement, and then after these time intervals, we're at a maximum negative displacement. So that's half an oscillation. A full oscillation is when this point then returns again to its maximum positive displacement. These are referred to as the nodes of the stationary wave. Nodes are points along a stationary wave where the displacement is always zero. So if we consider our stationary wave at three different points along this oscillation, so a time t1 here, a time t2, and a time t3, and we can see how each of the points along this wave are oscillating because their displacement is changing. However, there are certain points that at all three of these times are at zero displacement, and that is these points here. So these points are called the nodes of the stationary waves. And at these points, the displacement is always zero. And we can see this because we've got our stationary wave at various points in time. And at all these points in the oscillation, the displacement at these points is zero. So that's how we define our nodes. The points midway between the nodes oscillate with maximum displacement in either direction. So we can see that halfway between the nodes, we have these points of maximum displacement at all times. So they occur here and here. So it could be maximum positive or negative displacement. And then they are halfway between our nodes. And like we saw before, over time we've gone from a maximum positive displacement to a maximum negative displacement. And this corresponds to half an oscillation of our stationary wave. These points are referred to as antinodes of the stationary wave. Antinodes are points along a stationary wave midway between the nodes. They oscillate with maximum displacement. So again, we've got our stationary wave at various points in time. So we've got the oscillation at a time t1, at a time t2, and at a time t3. And we've already marked on our nodes. So we've already marked on our nodes on this diagram. So now we're going to mark on our antinodes, which are midway between the nodes. So this means we have antinodes at this point, this point, this point, and this point along our stationary wave, and also these points as well. And we can see that at our antinodes, we have our maximum displacement. So we can see this here. We have our maximum amplitude at all of these points and so on. So we have max amplitude. So when marking on nodes and antinodes, we need to be very careful to mark them on the stationary wave. So this bottom image here is a common diagram of a stationary wave showing its constituent progressive waves. So we've got our two constituent progressive waves here that actually create our stationary wave. So we can also mark our nodes and antinodes on this diagram, but we need to be careful to think about where the stationary wave will always have zero displacement, because we can see that on our stationary wave on this diagram, which is the blue line, 
is always at a zero displacement at this point in time. So on this diagram, we've already drawn in our nodes. So that's these red crosses here. So we've already drawn in the nodes on this diagram, and these are our points that always have zero displacement. So no matter how great the amplitude of the wave is, these points always have zero displacement. So we're then able to draw in our antinodes halfway between the nodes. So these are our antinodes, and these always come between our nodes. So it's always easier to draw on the nodes and then draw in the antinodes, because as you can see, at this particular point in time, across the whole stationary wave, we have zero displacement. So it's harder to identify the antinodes. But we just do this by first identifying the nodes, which are the points where we always have zero displacement. So now let's look at an example with a stationary wave. Stationary waves can be seen on a rope if two people send waves continuously along from either end. The rope is seven meters long and there are seven nodes, including those at the end. What is the wavelength of the progressive waves responsible? So we've been told that we have seven nodes, including the ones at the end. So remember, nodes are where we have zero displacement. So that's at this point here, this point here, 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 and here and also where the person's actually holding the rope, because that's also a point of zero displacement. And we can see that we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven nodes, just as we were told in the question. And we've also been told that the rope itself is seven meters long. So now our first step is to draw a sketch of the problem and mark on the nodes. So that's what we've got here. Our red crosses are our nodes and we've been told that the rope itself is seven meters long. Our second step is to mark on one oscillation. So we know that one oscillation is one full cycle here because then this oscillation can be repeated to produce our full wave and that's because this point here is at the same point in its cycle as this point here. So that's how we identify one oscillation. It's between two points that are at the same point in the wave cycle. So that means that they've got the same displacement and the same velocity. Our third step is to measure the fraction of the rope that one wavelength covers. So we know that one wavelength corresponds to the length of one oscillation. So that means this distance here is one wavelength, this distance here is one wavelength, and this distance here is one wavelength and we know that the rope itself is seven meters long. And now our final step is to calculate the wavelength. So we've said we've got three lambda across the seven meters because we've got three full wavelengths. So that means three lambda is equal to seven meters. So lambda will be equal to seven divided by three. So if we type this into our calculator, we get that lambda is equal to 2.333 recurring meters. So to two significant figures, lambda is equal to 2.3 meters. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level physics resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revised smiley face and together, let's make A-level physics a walk in the park.